Atari was founded in 1972 by video game pioneer Nolan Bushnell, the man who had created the first coin-operated video game, Computer Space, and had brought Pong to the masses. Although the early games were impressive simply because they existed, Atari's coin-op division truly entered a golden age in the late 70s and early 80s, when titles like Asteroids, Battlezone, and Tempest ruled the arcades. In this package are arcade-perfect conversions of six of those great games, Super Breakout, Battlezone, Tempest, Missile Command, Asteroids, and Centipede. Together, these games have grossed hundreds of millions of dollars in arcades across the world. And thanks to special emulation technology from Digital Eclipse, you can now play the games on your console system exactly as they were in the arcade. Even the bugs are still there. But just playing the games doesn't do them historical justice, which is why we've provided background information and exclusive insight into the games from the creative geniuses behind them. Ed Logg, who created Asteroid, Super Breakout, and was co-creator of Centipede with Donna Bailey. Dave Toyer, who created Tempest and Missile Command, and Ed Rotberg, designer and programmer of Battlezone. What was it like at Atari during this golden age? How could so many great games come from one company? As Ed Rotberg explains, the people had a lot to do with it. I think one of the really wonderful things about having been at Atari uh, during that period of time of the late 70s, early 80s was the people that worked there, the, you know, the entire group of people, and not just as individuals, but you know, we not only worked together, but we socialized together, we played together. Um, it was a real camaraderie that I've you know, never seen quite duplicated to that extent anywhere else. With such creative people around, Atari took an interesting tack towards game development. Once assigned, a project was under the direction of a single programmer, but game concepts were developed communally at off-site brainstorming sessions. Here's Ed Rotberg discussing the sessions. The brainstorming sessions really, uh, really reflected a lot of the culture uh, that went on at Atari at that time, and it was it was really nice. Uh, uh, people were, you know, uh, encouraged to submit ideas and not be critical of other people's ideas, but to take them and run with them. Um, eventually, you know, they became more, uh, people became more and more prepared. They were less extemporaneous uh, than they were in the early days, but uh, it was really a hotbed of creativity. We had a, a number of extremely creative uh, as well as technically proficient people at Atari and uh, it was just a, a wonderful time to be around all that good energy and, and all of that creativity. Of course, not all the creativity went towards finished products. Quite a bit was devoted to just having fun. Atari was an entertainment company after all. Most of the jokes grew out of strange products and often they came at the expense of an engineer's favorite target, the marketing department. Ed Logg explains how one aborted game concept, Turtle Races, that popped up at every session turned into a long-running prank. At one point, you know, year after year, we've done the same thing at brainstorming sessions. Our VP of marketing got him and said, okay guys, absolutely no more turtles. No more turtles. Absolutely no more turtles. 
And so uh, later in the brainstorm, we had one of the waiters bring up a, a drink for him because he was thirsty. And we got one of these little wind-up turtles. We stuck it in the drink, and so it goes <laughs> We hand it up to him, and he, he just takes the glass, and there's splash, splash, splash. Everybody's breaking out and laughing. It didn't end there. In addition to sending the marketing director turtle cards and turtle dolls, Ed Logg made a little change to the golden edition of Asteroids that sat in Atari's lobby. Turtle roids, that was another joke. So what I did was I took asteroids and I replaced the small and large saucers with turtles. And so, and it, we had the golden edition out in the lobby of Atari. And so I went in and swapped the uh, game proms and they had these turtles floating around. And so one day he walked in, look, and sure enough, there are turtles there. <laughs> Still, once a game was decided on, the creators got to work hard. Because it's impossible to tell if concepts on paper will really work as games. The products often change dramatically between assignment and finished product, as Ed, Dave, and Ed discuss here. You start out with one idea in mind, and as you're playing it, you know, you may find that people are creating their own game in the way that they play it, uh, or there's one particular part of the game that's more fun than the rest of it. So the game kind of dictates where it should go, I mean, by people's response to it. And, uh, it, they, you know, they change as they go. It's not like, well, we had this idea and we made it happen just like that. It doesn't happen that way very often. Yeah. For, like, uh, like, well, for example, uh, Temp Tempest started out as first-person space invaders. Right. And I brought it up, uh, we played it, we had a marketing review, and they said, this is sure, first-person space invaders, but it's not much fun. Uh, do you have any ideas, Dave? And I says, well, I got this idea where there's this hole in the ground and there's monsters coming out, and I can, I can make this thing into that hole in the ground nightmare. And so I, they came back like two weeks later, and, and they said, this is fun. Let's, let's do this, and that was Tempest. I had another case, too. A centipede was originally, uh, all the mushrooms were fixed position. You couldn't shoot them, and there weren't anything to create them. And it was uh, Dan Vanner, a VP, during one of the reviews, said, you know, isn't there some way we can you know, shoot the mushrooms, because he wanted to shoot the mushrooms, get them out of the way. And I said, well, you know, if I shoot the mushrooms, I'm going to have to have somebody create them, and I'm probably another person that eats them up, and so on. And, and that's basically how it came about all the, you know, the spider could eat the mushrooms, and any time you shoot a centipede, it would stick one back. And I would, a certain number of shots to get rid of it. And so that's how game developed. And once I added that, you know, it was suddenly, this is fun. Even after a game was mostly done, it was still possible to make changes. That's where the field tests came in. In field tests, which are still done today with new coin ops, a prototype version of the game is secretly shipped to an arcade to judge players' reactions. If they're good, the game moves into production. If not, the project is either killed or revamped. The period just before an initial field test is the most stressful in the development cycle. To kill yourself to get your game ready for the field test, yeah. I mean, you'd work around the clock, sometimes three, three, four days in a row without sleeping. And when those results would come in, it was, you know, you, it was worth it, yeah. you know, it's like you'd look at them and if, if they were good, it was like, wow, you know, this is the best feeling in the world. And if they were not so good, what can I do? In fact, for Ed Logg, it was the most important element in the entire development cycle of the game. For me, the most important was field test where you can walk up and if the kid puts his money in, sort of gets frustrated, but puts his money back in again, that's okay. Especially I got when, it. When they, put, when they had to put a sign on your game that said, maximum two, two, two plays, plays per person, then you knew you had a that's hit. That's right. Yeah. It's also interesting to go to a field test and find all your competitors there checking out your product. Yep. That was always a good sign too. Well, it's a good and bad sign, because that means they know about it. They know where you're testing, which is, you know, bad. Yeah, but the other part is they're so interested in your game, they're out there taking pictures, videotapes, and sending them back to their headquarters. Even in the midst of this most difficult time in the development of the game, in such a stressful environment, the engineers never lost their sense of humor. One of the guys had worked all night on his video game, and they had a, had a field test uh, the next afternoon, and they threw it in the back of the pickup, went screaming all, all the way to they the... Didn't, they didn't strap it down. <laughs> they didn't strap it down good enough. They went around a corner... The game went over the backside of the truck and smashed in a million pieces. I, I was, the they brought, it was great. They brought back the, the, the parts and they put them back in the lab. And I took a piece of paper and I wrote failed field test and slapped <laughs> it on there.
Of course, making light of the occasional disaster wasn't the only way the engineers let off steam. There was plenty of fun to be had in the labs as well. Oh, one of the uh, engineers uh, um, was working on a, a new PC board, and uh, and so one of the guys decided, you know, to pull a little pl prank on him. And uh, uh, after uh, Dave had gone home, uh, this other gentleman, who shall remain nameless, wired up a uh, uh, a flash bulb, a flash cube to the uh, bottom side of the board, uh, hooking it up to, uh, you know, plus 12 in ground, so that the next morning when Dave came in and plugged his board in, you know, he got this huge flash and puff of smoke out from the bottom of his board and uh, caused immediate panic. One of the better consequences of having a lab full of game designers was that, in addition to endless streams of practical jokes, the creators had instant access to some very tough testers. Ed Rotberg explains. One way you can really tell that a game is exciting, a game is going to be successful, is if people are playing it in the lab. Of course, sometimes a game got too popular. In early prototypes, there was only one copy of the game in existence, and if you had to keep shooing people off your development hardware, it could get annoying. This very situation led to a legendary Atari development prank. Ed was constantly having to kick people, and in particular, Owen Rubin, off of his asteroid station uh, so that he could work on it, and so Owen would stay late at night, and he would fill up the high score table with his initials, and everybody was getting tired of this, so Ed put in some code to uh, check for all the variations of Owen Rubin's initials, and whenever he would put it in, uh, it would put in Ed's initials instead. He came back and said, hey, I think there's a bug in your program. I stuck my name and you know, my initials in, and it didn't show up. And so we let it go on for a day or two, and finally told him. As hard as they play, the creators of these games worked even harder, sometimes to the limits of their physical and mental endurance. Dave Toyer recounts how the desire to create a great game could lead to total exhaustion. The way I like to work best is when I can really get into, into it and just sort of, you, you load your mind up with everything that has to be um, done in that part of your program. And, and it's, it's hard to get into that, that state of mind. And once you get there, I hate to leave. So I, I basically threw out the 24-hour day and went, would just work until I've, I get so tired I couldn't stay awake anymore and then go home and sleep, then come back and go to work. But the worst times, or the most intense times, were uh, just before field test, sometimes when I'd go for three or four days without any sleep. I remember one time I had a field test on Friday and I'd been up for four days in a row and I actually got the game ready to go, but I, I couldn't, I was so tired I couldn't work the machine that burned the robs anymore because I couldn't remember how to punch the buttons on the keyboard. <laughs> so I had to invite one of my buddies in to, to work the keys and I just had to sort of say, like, okay, you, you do this and this and, and he, he worked, worked the buttons for me. In the end though, the hard work more than paid off. Nearly 20 years later, the popularity of these classic Atari games is as high as it ever was. Now, with this collection, we can again enjoy these classic titles. As for Ed, Dave, and Ed, all are still involved in some way with the game industry. How do they feel about all the interest people still have in their early work? Ed Rotberg sums it up best. I get email uh, from people who found me on the web or somehow or another and found out an address, and they, you know, tell me how much they enjoyed the game, and, you know, it feels great, it, you know, well beyond... Uh, uh, any money that might have been made, uh, and it, you know, believe me, it wasn't that much, um, to uh, just to have you know people know that people had some fun, you know, and enjoyed something you did that you created, uh, is one of the best feelings in the world. Ed Log, with help from Donna Bailey, created Centipede in 1981. With easy trackball control and perfectly balanced difficulty, it quickly became one of the most popular games of all time. At one point, Atari even raised the price of the unit in an attempt to kill sales and make way for the production of other games. The result? The game kept selling, and in the end, it was in production for over a year, one of the longest coin-op production runs of all time. Here, Ed Log relates the origin of the game and notes what he was, and more importantly, wasn't going for in terms of storyline. Uh, the original Centipede game was from a brainstorming idea called Bug Shooter. Uh, and other than shooting bugs, that's really all I had in mind. I was not going to go through any elaborate uh, storyline about your often never-never world and it's an 
inhabited with a bunch of bugs, and if you shoot them all, and then you get the princess back or anything. After a number of changes to the initial design, which didn't include the spider or allow you to shoot mushrooms, the game was finished, but not before Atari's legal department mandated one more change to the shooter at the bottom of the screen. Originally, it was supposed to be the Atari insignia, which is, you know, the two things and the bow in the middle, and the lawyers came back and said, oh, looks too much like the Atari logo, and the fact that you shoot that center thing out, that, you know, kills our, you know, trademark, you know, can't do that. Okay, so I changed it a little bit. Savvy gamers may have noticed that in the game's graphics set, there's a grasshopper that never actually appears in the game. Here, Ed reveals the reason for the grasshopper and why it was never implemented. There's an interesting story about the grasshopper and centipede. Uh, I've actually received letters, you know, people from players saying, hey, there's a centipede in the graphics, you know, what, uh, there's a grasshopper in centipede's graphics, you know, what, what, where does it show up? How do I get it? And actually, the grasshopper was done initially because it was supposed to hop out you know, like the spider and try to hop where you were because I was afraid people would stay in a particular spot and just you know, hide in a little corner and stay there. Well, it turns out with the spider's algorithm, there really is no safe spot and you really do have to move around a lot. And so I never bothered to implement or actually I left out the grasshopper's algorithm, and, but I left the graphics in there just for the purpose of entertaining some, uh, somebody who's actually going out looking for something secret. Log prides himself on his bug-free code, but there is one bug in a version of Centipede. In the game as you advance, the area that the spider roams in shrinks, making him more dangerous. In the cocktail version of the game, though, the second player plays on a flipped screen, but the spider's area is not flipped, so as you advance, his roaming area actually moves to the top of the screen. Ed explains the consequences. Well, if you're the second player on the other side of the screen, because your screen is now upside down, uh, what, instead of shrinking it this way, I shrank it this way, so his area got bigger. And of course, he was much easier to hunt. And there are several strategies in Centipede where you simply do nothing but hunt the spider. But the spider also takes care of mushrooms, and there was another strategy called blob strategy, that you try to keep a blob of mushrooms just above the area, and uh, that destroyed that strategy completely. So it was, turned out to be an interesting feature, but it was certainly a, a bug that I was not aware of. Asteroids takes its controls, rotate, thrust, shoot, and hyperspace from the first video game ever, Steve Russell's Space War, which was created on a mainframe computer at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. Unlike Space War, though, in asteroids, your main enemies are drifting rocks, not other ships, although the UFOs certainly add a high challenge level to the game. One of the most interesting elements of the game is that it runs on a vector, or XY monitor. Unlike a TV which creates an image by drawing one horizontal line across the TV at a time, a vector monitor draws straight lines across the monitor from point to point. Ed Logg explains why he chose a vector system for asteroids. Well, the reason I wanted to work on a vector game is because it had much higher resolution. Asteroids had like a 1024 by 768 resolution as compared to a TV screen, which is like 300 by 240, 320 by 240, it's very typical. Uh, so you get much better picture qualities. Uh, when normally you draw on raster, you get a nice little stair-stepping. Mm -hmm. uh, when you do it on a vector, it looks like a nice smooth straight line. So it really made it very effective, especially when doing small little ships and shots and things like that. You wanted everything to be nice and smooth. That decision, though, led to a curious bug in the game that caused the screen to occasionally fade in and out when only a few items were present on screen. Here he explains how this is actually a problem with the hardware used by Atari in production versions of the game. All monitors have a problem with uh, uh, screen burn. Uh, you see a lot of, like uh, PCs now, they do basically screensavers. Well, in the old days, in asteroids, we couldn't put a screensaver up there. Uh, you know, although we did swap screens around a little bit. But what we did is we had a protection circuit. There's actually a second problem with an XY monitor I should bring up too. And that is if for something should go wrong with the electronics on the board, the monitor's beam would just go down to a single point. And since all that energy is at a single point, it would burn a hole in the screen. So we had uh, special circuitry on there that basically said if 
you're not drawing far enough apart, then turn off the beam. Well, it turns out that the copyright in the bottom and the scorer and a little bit of stuff at the top was just enough drawing so that it would not erase the screen. And so we found that wasn't quite the case, but there were some monitors that were not quite up to spec with others. And, and if you had like one rock and the asteroid was, or your spaceship was in the middle of the screen, it would sort of fade away to black. And as everything moved away, it would come back to bright again. <laughs> Probably the most popular strategy in asteroids is to destroy all but one asteroid, then wait and simply shoot UFOs. This is known as the lurk strategy. Unfortunately, if you get too good at this strategy, building up more than 200 plus ships, you reset the machine. Ed explains why. You know, I actually tried the lurk strategy, you know, getting down to a couple um, rocks and then trying to shoot the, the, uh, the guys, but I just couldn't do it and I said, ah, pff, nah, nobody else can do it and just left it the way it was and it turned out that, of course, people could master it. In fact, they got to the point where they could master it so well that they could build up hundreds of lives. But, and you, you, this is not a bug. Um, the hardware has a protection in it that you don't come back to it every so often. It calls, it's called a watchdog reset and it resets the board, and starts all over from scratch. But if I spend all this time drawing all the ships across the screen, all your extra lives, it basically runs out of tr time and causes a reset. So if the guy builds up too many extra lives, of course the board would reset. On a personal note, asteroids may have been instrumental in getting Ed together with his wife. He recounts the story of how it introduced him to his future wife at an Atari Christmas party. He introduced me to her and uh, basically introduced me as, here's the best video game designer in the world, you know. And she was impressed because she always liked asteroids. Um, but we started dating about probably seven months later, eight months later, and we're married now. The marriage has led to one interesting consequence in Ed's substantial coin-op game collection, which includes all his games, as well as some prototypes and other favorites like Robotron. And it turns out I met my wife, and she uh, had an Asteroids game as well, so we actually have two Asteroids games at home. Wow. One is hers and one's mine. Ed Rotberg's Battlezone, one of the first 3D games ever, is still a favorite anywhere it can be found. It's also spawned more rumors than almost any other coin-op of the era, since a special version of the game was allegedly created for the military to train tank drivers. Like many of Atari's great games, it was first conceived at an off-site brainstorming session. Battlezone actually came about uh, um, through uh, the brainstorming sessions uh, that we had uh, off-site uh, during that time. Uh, Howard Delman had developed a f pretty powerful vector generator uh, to do vector-based graphics and uh, the thrust, one of the thrusts for that brainstorming session was to do a, uh, a first-person 3D or multiple first-person 3D based games and uh, Battlezone was one of the concepts that came out of that brainstorming session. One of the rumors among gamers at the time Battlezone was released was that it was actually possible, if you were good enough, to drive all the way to the animated volcano in the background. Here, Ed lays that rumor to rest and explains the origin of the volcano and how it came to be animated. You cannot get to the volcano in Battlezone. The whole idea with volcano in Battlezone, um, we wanted to have some background that was basically like a cylinder of wallpaper that you could never get to that traveled with you. Um, and uh, Roger Hector, you know, drew this up in vectors for us and he decided to put in a volcano. And so the volcano was in there and it was just, you know, paper in the background. I mean, it, it didn't do anything. And Owen Rubin, who was uh, one of my lab mates at the time, every day would come into the lab and say, you know, when are you gonna make the volcano active? When are you gonna make the volcano active? And I was busy trying to make a game, you know, <laughs> trying to make the volcano active. And finally I said, look, you program the code and I'll put it in, we'll make the volcano active. Showed up at work the next day and there it was on my, my uh, chair uh, in front of my station. and. Uh, he had written, written the code and I uh, plugged it in and uh, sure enough we have an active volcano because of that. The possibility of Battlezone being used to train U.S. Army troops was quite a controversial issue when the news was first reported. Since then, stories about military Battlezone have circulated among many gamers. Now, for the first time ever, Ed Rotberg reveals the true story behind the myth. Did the Army want a military version of the game? Sort of.
Well, it really wasn't the U.S. Army. It was a group of consultants um, that were uh, trying to develop a, uh, an inexpensive training device uh, for the uh, Bradley fighting vehicles. Uh, and um, uh, the, this outside consultant group, which consisted of a lot of uh, ex-Army generals, you know, came and contacted uh, people here at, at Atari and uh, said, can you do a custom version of Battlezone that will specifically train for this uh, new vehicle we have? And uh, they decided we could do that. Unlike most video games, it was not a fun project to work on. One of the people here had taken it on as his project and, you know, basically got me assigned to do it. And uh, I don't have particularly fond memories of it. I lost like three and a half months of my life living here constantly trying to meet a deadline that they had set up based on a worldwide conference that uh, Army Tradoc was having uh, by satellite. So uh, in order to get this done, you know, we were working here around the clock, weekends, um, Literally, I, you know, rarely saw my wife. Still, some innovations came from the product. Here, Ed reveals the most famous one, as well as the final outcome of the project. We uh, actually uh, copied the, um, the controller uh, from the uh, gunner's control uh, in the fighting vehicle. And in fact, that controller was the basis for the controller used in... Uh, in Star Wars and many other uh, Atari games from that point on. The demo unit was finished and then uh, I don't know all the, the reasons. Uh, like as I said, I was as anxious as possible to get off of it. I said I would do the prototype if I didn't have anything to do with any production plans. And they made that assurance to me and then there turned out to be no production plans and I don't know whether it was Atari. I believe it was Atari that decided they didn't want to get into that business, which I think was probably a wise decision. So the project was canceled, and Military Battlezone never saw the light of day. Still, there were those prototypes. What became of them? Ed Rotberg knows, but he would not go into any more detail than the following. There's at least one prototype existing in the world. Dave Toyer's attempt to create a first-person version of Space Invaders led to what many people consider one of the seminal video games of all time. Abstract, space-themed, challenging, and totally addictive, the game boasted a unique dial controller, color vector graphics, and some of the fastest gameplay yet seen. For all its pluses, though, the game almost didn't make it through its first marketing review. Dave Toyer recounts the journey the game took from concept to final design. Well, Tempest started out as uh, first-person Space Invaders. I thought, well, Space Invaders was one of my favorite games. And I thought, well, if I do first-person Space Invaders, that'll be a blast. So I, I whipped it together and had a marketing review on it. And we all played it, and it was, it was okay, but it wasn't a lot of fun. And so right, right there at that meeting, we said, well, should we kill it? And I says, well, I've got this other idea that's, that's sort of related. I said, I got this nightmare about this hole in the ground, and there's these monsters from the center of the Earth that are trying to get out of the hole and you have to smash them before they get out of the hole and kill you. And they said, sounds, sounds good, uh, let's try it out. So I basically just took first person space invaders and wrapped the surface into a circle, into a tunnel, and had the monsters coming down the tunnel at you, like coming out of a hole in the ground, and you tried to kill them before they got out, and we had another marketing review on it, and People loved it, and people would come in the lab and play it all the time, and I'd have to shoo them off the machine to work on it. And you know, I knew when that was happening that uh, I had a good thing going. Still, there were some problems with the game, notably that people were getting sick when they played it. A final tweak solved that problem. Well, first, uh, I had the, uh, the levels rotating. So you would turn the knob and the, and the cylinder would rotate with all the, all the creatures on the cylinder uh, rotating with the cylinder. And it was making people nauseous, uh, which is not a good thing. So we figured, well, what else can we do? We'll just leave the surface stationary and move the objects around on the surface. And that worked just fine. And it was less computationally intensive on top of it. Uh, so that solved the nausea problem.
Although most players think the game occurs in outer space, Toyer has always felt that the enemies were moving up a hole in the ground, this coming from an experience in his childhood which greatly shaped his design of the game. Where exactly did the idea for the game come from? Dave explains. Well, it was very simple. I mean, ever since I was a kid, I had these night not all the time, but I had these a few nightmares about a hole in the, in the earth and there's these monsters that live inside the earth and they would come out of the hole and you had to kill them before they got out and that's, that's the story. It's great that Tempest appears on this collection because due to maintenance problems, very few machines are left in arcades. One incident in particular stands out in Dave's mind as indicative of the hardware problems Tempest had. Tempest hardware has always been a problem. They, they never really got it working for long periods of time without problems. Uh, I remember one time in the lab, uh, my monitor stopped working and we looked, we looked up uh, under, under the, the monitor, under the circuit board, and it had gotten so hot and the board was upside down that all, like four or five of the components had actually desoldered themselves and had fallen out onto the top of the, the lab. On the other hand, the software was free of bugs in the later versions. The first version of the ROMs actually did contain one slight inadvertent error, an error that could give clever players $10 in free credits. There was only one bug in Tempest. And it wasn't actually a, yeah, it was a bug. Um, we designed security into all the games to prevent the uh, foreign companies from, from ripping them off. There was garage operations in the Far East where they would take our games and remove all the Atari copyrights and logos and put their own stuff in and then sell them as their own games. So I had protection in Tempest that, that checked to make sure Atari was on the screen in certain positions. Well, right before I shipped Tempest, um, I tweaked some of the positions on the screens to make sure that everything was perfectly symmetrical. And I forgot to change one of the checks on that position and the copy protection then went in and detected that this thing was a little off and set up a, a time bomb that happened 10 minutes later. Well, if you're, if, and this only happened if your score was between 170,000 and like 190,000. So after it was out in the field for a couple of weeks, we started getting reports that people were getting 40 free credits. And I kept saying, no, it's, it's a hardware problem or something. Well, the hardware analyzer actually caught it in the act of me giving the player 40 credits and it turns out that I was using the, the, the tens digit as the location in RAM at which to store a 40 um, if, if the Atari wasn't on the screen in the right position. So that, that spread around and pretty soon the expert players were getting 40 free credits just by nailing the score. Tempest is certainly one of the best-loved games of all times, although Toyer now is no longer directly involved in making games. His latest project is an award-winning development tool, a product that makes doing computer graphic chores far easier for game artists and others. However, he is still enthused by the excitement that his game has generated and the amount of pleasure he has brought to gamers worldwide. I really get a kick out of seeing people still playing Tempest. Um, Every once in a while I get email from somebody saying, you know, I spent all my college tuition on playing your game. <laughs> yeah, that's great. So, I mean, the, the whole point of what I, what I did was to let people have a good time and just get, get away from the frustrations of normal life and just relax and, or maybe not relax, maybe just, I guess it's not very relaxing, but just get into another state of mind and forget about all your problems and just um, blow things up. No game better symbolized the Cold War tensions that overshadowed the golden age of Atari than Missile Command, a title where wave after wave of Soviet MIRVs rained down as you gallantly manned three ABM batteries to defend the cities of your country. With pinpoint trackball control, the game enables users to overcome seemingly overwhelming odds, creating a feeling of total desperation in the player. As Dave Toyer explains, the concept captivated him from the start. 
Missile Command, I was working on four-player soccer and Steve Calfee, uh, the software manager, called me into his office and said, Dave, uh, we'd like you, to, after you finish this game, to work on a new game where the Russians are invading the U.S. and there's this radar screen and you can see the missiles coming in and you have to defend the country. And he said, so he said, just think about that for when, for your next game. And when I walked out of his office, I was, my spine was just tingling because I knew that this, this was like, wow, this is like a great idea. This is going to be, going to be great and it's going to be fun. Still, the game underwent a number of design simplifications before the final version shipped. Dave explains the progress of the game from concept to completion. It was much more complicated to start with. There was going to be a, a coast specific to wherever the game was located to make it more relevant to who was playing. Um, there was, there was city, city names. There was railroads supplying the cities from, from uh, factories. And we actually implemented all that stuff. And so you could blow up the railroads, you know, but it, it was too complicated. So to make it simple, we got rid of everything for, except for the cities and the bases. And it turns out that was the right way to do it. Those changes led to a simpler game with a more dedicated focus from the start. However, one of the major simplifications in the game didn't occur until after the initial field test. The first missile command that we field tested had a huge panel on the top with flashing lights and related to the gameplay. Yeah, it was about, about this big, or maybe this big, and we found that it distracted people because when they're playing the game they're looking up to try to see these status lights and stuff. So we just chopped off the whole top of the cabinet, saved ourselves a lot of money, and didn't hurt the gameplay any. One of most gamers' favorite elements of the game is the way that explosions cause multiple reactions. Balancing that element of the game was essential to its success. Well, the nice thing about that feature was that it gave you a lot more power than just little quick explosions. So one of the, the important things about timing the game, or tuning the game, was to get the length of the explosions right, because if they were too quick, you wouldn't have that, that extra power of the the cloud actually blowing up other incoming missiles. The fratricide of incoming missiles was key to most player strategies, including Toyer's. The strategy were, and I used in Missile Command was to lay out a pattern of missiles. It would, it would make a cloud across the center of the screen, and the incoming missiles would hit the cloud and blow up and form a secondary cloud. And a lot, you could have secondary and tertiary reactions where you could just sit back and watch. Sort of like uh, when you play pinball where you can sit back and watch after you hit the flippers. Over the years, Missile Command has become synonymous with video games and featured in numerous TV shows and movies. For Toyer though, one incident stands out. Well, one of the things that gave me a, a rush was seeing uh, Missile Command and Terminator 2 because I love uh, Schwarzenegger's movies and I love, Term especially his Terminator movies. And to see uh, Missile Command in, in the second movie was, was a blast. Despite the fact that it was just a game, Missile Command dealt with some serious issues. In the geopolitical climate in which it was conceived, the threat of nuclear war seemed very real to most Americans, and it was hammered home especially hard to Toyer. Here he recounts some of what he went through in developing the game. Well, Missile Command to me was, it was a lot of fun, but it was also a serious matter. And when Atari asked me to do the game, I, one of the things I said was, this is going to be a totally defensive game. It's not going to be an offensive game. I refused to do something where I had send off missiles to attack the USSR. Um, so I said, fine. So it's, it's a totally defensive game, and to me then it's, it's moral. You're defending your country against attack. Um, but the thought of um, what actually happens when there's a, a, nu you know, a nuclear attack is, is terrifying. And working on the game for six months, uh, I internalized a lot of the stuff, so I'd, I'd have nightmares about nuclear attacks. You know, I'd, I, in my dream I'd see a white streak going across the sky, just like in Missile Command, 
and I'd be up hiking in the mountains and I'd see it hit in the valley, like in Sunnyvale, and I'd see the explosion, and I'd, and I'd know that the blast was gonna hit me in like 15 seconds, and I'd wake up in a cold sweat. And this happened quite frequently when I was doing the game, and then it tapered off after the game, but still, you know, I had them for a couple of years afterwards, maybe one every two, three months. So it was, it was a sobering experience. Although you were defending cities from attack, the game always ended in defeat. Dave Toyer never considered putting in an ending. Well, that was the whole point of the game, was to show that if there was ever a nuclear war, that you would never win. So that's why there's no end. For an extremely small number of hardcore players, Missile Command did have an end condition, although you needed to exploit one of the game's only bugs to attain it. Missile Command is pretty free of bugs. The only one I know about is that if you get up around 820,000 points, I think it gives you like an infinite number of cities. But no, I, I don't, there's very few people that can get it up that high. Did he ever expect anyone to be able to exploit the bug? Not at all. But he was extremely impressed by the skill that those super players displayed. I was surprised to see how, how good people got at the games. Because in, in the laboratories, we, you know, people from the company would come in and play them. We thought, wow, that guy's good. And then we put it out there and, and have this huge population playing it. And just to see some people that were so good at something, it, it was like watching the Olympics. Now you know the story behind the games, go play.